I'm Nigel Greaves and I run the Nigel Greaves Gallery behind the Grand Hotel in Eastbourne and uh, I've been running that uh, successfully for the last seven years. I started in May 2008 when the gallery was opened by the BBC News presenter Bev Thompson and uh, she said to me then, you know you're starting in the beginning of recession, uh, if you can make a go of it now then you'll certainly make a go of it and uh, I'm glad to say that I have done. Um, I currently live in uh, Pevensey and uh, I wasn't born in Eastbourne, I was born in Berkshire. My parents were teachers and moved to Eastbourne in 1953. They bought a bungalow and uh, I moved to Eastbourne when I was six. Well, when I was at my day school, uh, I was pretty average at most things, but always uh, I thought pretty good at art. So um, I was destined to go to art college, which I did. Um, and I thought to myself, uh, this is a fantastic opportunity because I've always been good at art. But as soon as I got to art college, everyone else was better than me. It was three years of, of tremendous levelling and the competition and spirit was excellent in those days. And this was at the top of St Anne's Road, which is now uh, Flats. That was the uh, Eastbourne um, uh, College of Art Design that used to be the old grammar school. So it has an immense amount of history. And uh, I used to get the Southdown bus in from... Uh, Friday Street where the family lived and uh, walk all the way up to top of uh, St Anne's Road every morning and uh, there we were. Uh, did three years there, uh, fine art, art history and graphic design. When I left uh, Eastbourne uh, College of Art Design in 1966 uh, I went home and told my parents I wanted to open an art gallery and my, my father said to me well that's, that's a good idea but I think you really ought to get a proper job first. So um, I uh, started off at Beckett Newspaper selling advertising as a stopgap because I desperately wanted to open this gallery uh, and uh, I found that I enjoyed this job at the newspaper uh, and uh, within uh, several years I got my first promotion so I put the starting of the gallery on hold but very interesting in those days in 1966 because uh, Eastbourne was very different to how it is now of course uh, you could park in Terminus Road there were no double yellow lines, there were no traffic wardens, and you could park your car um, outside Woolworths and you could leave it there all day. Uh, there were many, many different types of business in Terminus Road, of course, uh, not like now. Uh, there used to be the butcher, the baker, candlestick maker, and small businesses were um, uh, everywhere in the town. A very different situation to now. So, uh, putting the gallery on hold, um, uh, I got married obviously, uh, children, uh, that takes your life over, stops me opening the gallery. But all during my career, I painted ready to open this gallery. So, uh, when I got to the age of uh, 40, had another promotion, uh, that put uh, the operation of the gallery on hold, but I was still painting. I then became a director of the company. Um, and that was uh, um, a life-changing situation because you know you get a better company car. Uh, but I'm I'm still painting all through my career, ready to open the gallery. And when I opened the gallery, of course, uh, my accountant was quite stunned to find that I was opening a business without having to buy any stock. I'd already got my stock, which was uh, a good good situation. Um, and particularly uh, opening. Uh, in a recession, at the start of a recession, um, that was a challenge. But uh, I soon realised that uh, it was a good thing to do and I should have done it really from day one. Um, but my career helped me enormously because mm -hmm. I was dealing with uh, a plethora of different types of business. Um, as I say, from butcher, baker to candlestick maker, uh, right through to large stores, estate agents, the, the whole gamut. And it gave me a tremendous insight into different types and styles of businesses and how they were run. And it really sort of uh, opened me up, if you like, and it helped me in my creativeness in terms of producing artwork. Um, but of course, uh, being uh, trained as a graphic designer, um, that's what has helped me to produce uh, a wide range of, of, um, of, of, of artwork. I have a discipline to produce um, uh, different types of, of work, different subjects, uh, because everybody's different. And if you're selling artwork, you've got to try uh, as best as you can to appeal to the mass market. But going back to Beckett Newspapers, uh, the changes there were dramatic. Uh, in Pevensey Road, where the Eastbourne Gazette and Herald was, 
Um, we had the old liner type machines, it was called Hot Metal. We then changed over to um, letterpress and web offset. And uh, of course, it's very famous with Fortress Whopping, Eddie Shaw, and all that with free newspapers. We went all through that. And uh, the interesting thing about the uh, Beckett newspaper group is that the Eastbourne Gazette, that has been published since 1859, has never missed a midweek slot. It is always published. And in fact, it is still uh, probably one of the only midweek paid for uh, newspapers uh, left in the UK. Uh, the Eastbourne Herald uh, was first uh, incorporated in 1924 as the Eastbourne Herald Chronicle. Uh, and that changed to the Eastbourne Herald in the 70s. And then the uh, Eastbourne Gazette series uh, was launched uh, in the 80s uh, with the addition of the Seaford Gazette and the Hailsham Gazette. And now that's all combined into one. Um, how are newspapers doing? Well, uh, they've dropped in circulation because of, uh, of, uh, of media. The plethora of media has caused uh, huge uh, differences in uh, appetites for news. Um, but uh, I think it's leveled to what it is. Yeah, the gallery is uh, situated behind the Grand Hotel, uh, very good for parking. Uh, when I first took it over, it was um, uh, the Stacey Marks Gallery, and uh, they were selling paintings uh, in multi-thousands. And uh, I think they were finding it difficult in the recession uh, to, to continue. Um, so in I came uh, with my paintings uh, that were in hundreds, not thousands, and, uh, and, 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 and they were selling, and they're, they're selling now. Um, I paint every day. Um, I have a very, very different client base um, from people that buy watercolours to people that want large abstracts to fill their minimalist homes. And uh, offices um, are quite interested in some of the big, bold works. Uh, I recently put 25 pieces of work in a, a big um, financial institution in the corner of Conduit Street and Regent Street in London. So that's probably my biggest gallery in London. Um, but people come from far and wide. Um, um, holiday makers, recommendation. Um, I use a lot of leaflets, obviously, to extol the virtues of the gallery. And um, one thing I've got actually in restaurants is if you go into the ladies and gents loos, uh, I have a little framed um, advertisement, uh, which actually produces quite interesting results because people would come in and say that they've seen it. Um, but uh, the interesting thing I think about the gallery is that uh, it's a gallery with one artist's work. Um, all through my career uh, in advertising, uh, I did look long and hard at those galleries that were uh, successful and those that weren't, and I wanted to know why. And I soon discovered that those that were successful were the galleries that had a wide variety of work. Um, so for whatever reason, I, I followed that path and uh, it, it, it seems to work. Because somebody can come in and they can dismiss everything here and come out with just one painting. Um, and, and, and that's how it goes. Um, well, when I was at Beckett Newspapers, um, I, I remember we had to deal with a, a, quite a tricky situation. I dealt with Leeson's, the butchers who were in Termas Road, Hailsham, and also in the Langley Centre, um, brilliant family firm. And um, I went to see them uh, once for a, a half-page advertisement, and they had a bit of competition, I think, in the town. And they were quite clear about Leeson's meat. Uh, it, you can't beat their quality. Uh, you can't beat their price. They were unbeatable. That's what they wanted to say. So uh, we did an advertisement, half-page, um, and uh, the title was Leeson's Meat uh, is Hard to Beat and the quality is hard to, to beat all the rest of it. Um, uh, and some clot in, in our um, printing department set the type as Leeson's Meat is Hard to Eat and it was actually published in the Eastbourne Herald uh, in October, I think it was, in 1972. And I had to go around and talk to the Leeson brothers 
uh, who were uh, really, really, uh, you know, big, strong butchers. And it's the way they were looking at me, saying, what are you going to do about it? And I just had to rerun the advertisement saying, Leeson's meat is hard to beat. Because beat and eat, you see, obviously the, the compositor who was setting it obviously thought meat, eat, and that's how it went in. So that was an interesting story there as far as the newspaper goes. Um, there was one with Birdseye when they set uh, an advertisement and Birdseye were after shift workers and it actually appeared in the paper, Birdseye requires shift workers. They left out the F. So those were two very red-faced situations that I had to deal with. Um, the funniest thing I think that happened in the gallery was I had a, a couple came in um, I believe they were staying at the Grand Hotel, uh, fairly elderly, and they were humming and hiring about this particular landscape. And uh, the lady said, well, Frank, where are you going to put it? Oh, I'll find somewhere to put it, he said, at that price. Because uh, I'd already told him it was, it was 12 95 and he thought that was you know, quite, quite a good price. It was a very large, nice frame. Anyway, he came to pay for it, and um, he said, well, we're staying at the hotel. And I said, I'm not sure if it was the Grand, it could have been. Um, and he said, uh, I'll come and collect it this afternoon. Can you wrap it up for me? I said, that's fine. He said, I'll pay for it now. And he handed me a £20 note. He thought it was twelve ninety five, And it was twelve hundred ninety five. So I think that was the funniest one I've had. I've also had people that have come in that have queried the price uh, because it's the other way. Um, are you sure? Um, you know, I, I've come from London, you know, we normally expect to pay sort of three or four times that price. Does it include the frame? Um, and I say, yes, it does, because I do my own framing, you see. That keeps the cost down, and that's another reason why the gallery is successful here. Commercial framing is expensive, um, and, uh, you know, I have the luxury, if you like, of choosing my own frames and, and giving some time and thought about it, rather than going to a frame and saying, you just frame this, and they'll frame it how they see fit. Well, the pier is such an iconic, um, uh, very statuesque object, you can't miss it. Um, and it, if you talk about Eastbourne, you, you have to talk about and think about the pier. Um, my parents uh, used to uh, talk about dances on the pier in the, in, in the ballroom, which of course ended up as an amusement arcade. Um, but the, the, the pier itself is, is, is quite a stunning structure. Uh, in the winter when you get uh, force seven gales and uh, you get high tides you wonder how on earth that structure is is able to stand up and I remember once we were uh, having a meeting um, with the marketing group at the end of the pier and it was blowing a howling gale um, both there and back we got soaked going there and soaked coming back and of course that's what you have to do you have to choose which side you went down the pier um, but with regard to the, the terrible fire, uh, I was actually here in the gallery when uh, pretty soon people outside were saying, the pier's on fire, the pier's on fire. So uh, I closed the gallery thinking, this can't be right, and the pier on fire. And as soon as I got to the top of the road there, I could see the, 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 the belching smoke. And um, it was dreadful. Uh, there was almost an eerie calm. People couldn't believe it. They were just standing there watching it. And it's, I've never been in a situation where there's been a crowd of people so quiet that actually couldn't believe what was happening. And uh, uh, yeah, it was a terrible day. Uh, but yesterday, in fact, I went down and walked round the pier and, and had a look to see what's happening. And they're having to replace an immense amount of ironwork underneath, um, as I thought they would do, because the heat of the, of, of the fire was obviously has buckled and melted some of the structure. So let's hope it gets back to its original, original formidable looking pier. Well now, um, from the age of uh, nine until I was 12, I was in the Eastbourne Silver Band. And uh, I learnt to play the cornet and the euphonium and in fact any, any uh, instrument with a, with a three valve configuration. And uh, that was great fun. Um, uh, and the year, I think it was probably 19... 59, uh, I played solo cornet with Dagrader Hollands and we played the Eaton Boating song on the bandstand. 
and I was terrified. Uh, I was nine and a half years old. I just learnt this piece of music, and um, you can imagine uh, just to see a sea of people in front of you, and of course all your peers behind you, all the old guys there waiting for you to slip up. Um, but uh, I remember it with uh, with great affection every time I go past the the bandstand, uh, being there on that summer's day, having to play my cornet. But um, much to my uh, uh, parents' um, disdain, I, uh, I joined the Sea Cadets <laughs> because my, my mates were in the Sea Cadets and I was there uh, until I uh, went to art college. Yeah, I, I did go to the King's uh, Country Club. Um, th that was uh, uh, really a, a very interesting entertainment uh, venue. Uh, they had some brilliant stars there. Um, I saw the Three Degrees, um, Tommy Cooper, uh, and and all those famous people. Um, Kings was uh, the venue to be to be at at a weekend, and you could go there and have a meal as well, and you could park there, and they didn't charge you for parking. And I, I, Eastbourne misses Kings Country Club uh, desperately because there's nothing and has been nothing to replace it. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Eastbourne lifeboat is interesting and it's had a, a, an amazing history. Um, it's saved so many lives and of course a lot of people don't realise it's all voluntary. Um, uh, but my, my best uh, memory of the Eastbourne lifeboat is when I was the president of the Industrial Association in Eastbourne, um, uh, my secretary um, suggested that it might be an idea if I went out on the lifeboat for a bit of publicity. So anyway, I turned up on a Sunday, um, suitably dressed, and it was windy, and it was rough. And the, the coxswain of the lifeboat said to me, are you sure you want to go out, Nigel? Uh, it's a bit rough out there, I don't you to get hurt, he said. This was Derek Huggett, the coxswain. So I said, no, that's fine. I mean, obviously a bit a lifeboat, you, you wouldn't expect it to be anything else other than safe. So I put the kit on and I was dressed up like a life, lifeboat man. And of course, in those days, uh, it went down the chute um, uh, in, in Royal Parade. So uh, down the chute we went and crash. Uh, we got soaked immediately and uh, off we went and uh, it was bobbing up and bobbing down, bobbing up and bobbing down. And the coxswain could see that I was a little bit uh, shaken, if you like, from this. So we had to be strapped in and we had to be clipped on. And he said to me, uh, right, steer south 180. I always remember this, Derek Huggett, and south 180. So I was there, I was holding on. I was actually, uh, you know, captain of the lifeboat. I was the coxswain for a minute, it was great fun. Uh, but I was terrified. I, I must admit, I was, I was scared. But uh, after sort of uh, 25 minutes, when I could see that the, the youngsters around me were not terrified, it was just um, a normal Sunday exercise, although it was very rough weather, uh, that, 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 that put me at ease and I, I enjoyed the rest of it immensely. Yeah, the theatres in Eastbourne are interesting. Um, and particularly going back when uh, I was the investment director at Beckett Newspapers, we had to uh, juggle the advertising with the borough council's budget. The Congress was uppermost in the council's thoughts, of course, because it was the flagship, and uh, that had um, a, um, an amazing amount of stars that came, and uh, I think in most cases filled the theatre when they had the big, the big stars. Um, the, 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 the Hippodrome, of course, has got amazing history. Uh, my mother uh, tells me of um, stories when she was a tiller girl there uh, in the Hippodrome, because my mother was born in Eastbourne, and she would go there with her sister and her friends and, and, and dress up there on a Friday and Saturday night, and uh, they would entertain the people before the, the main act came on. Beachy Head uh, is, is very important to the town because it really put Eastbourne on the map. It puts Eastbourne on the map regularly because people occasionally jump off. Um, but what people don't know uh, are how many people actually go to Beachy Head with the intent of jumping off but change their mind. 
And it's interesting because John Surtees uh, came to our Rotary Club uh, a few years ago and uh, gave us a, a talk, um, an after lunch talk about um, people that were ending their lives on Beachy Head. And what's interesting is that the amount of people that they don't actually jump off, most people will spin round and disorientate themselves and then find their way to the edge. Uh, some people will, will roll over and roll off. They don't actually just jump off. So the jumping off um, bit is not strictly true. Um, when we were in the marketing group, we had this mad idea of putting a net down there. We thought this would be amazing publicity, uh, where we could have this net at the bottom, probably at about 10 metres on struts to stop people from jumping off, but it, it never got through. But it would have been a bit of fun. The change in Eastbourne has been really dramatic. Um, if, if I look at uh, the, one of my student jobs working at Duncan Foster the Bakery uh, in Lockbridge Drove, it was a single track. Now it's almost like a motorway. And uh, Eastbourne, of course, uh, does need some good communications uh, out of the town. But the road structure uh, in, in, in Eastbourne with regard to the Cross Levels Way and the new strip that goes from Hannon Park to Polgate is obviously much better than it was. Um, the Hannon Park level crossing is, is quite a stunning situation. Uh, when I was in the marketing group, um, uh, we thought we could probably do something about it, but we, we couldn't because you know British Rail, uh, once, once you've got a, a, a rail line going through, it takes precedence over everything else. Um, there were views and thoughts about having a bridge across the top, but of course it meant demolishing so many buildings, so that never happened. Um, but the change in Eastbourne, is, I think, has been mostly uh, dramatic in terms of building the housing at uh, uh, Sovereign Harbour, at Friday Street and Langney. Um, if, if you were to take a photograph or an aerial picture of how it was, say, 2530, 40 years ago, you'd be astonished at the change and the rapid change as well. Um, demographically, Eastbourne has changed quite a bit. Um, it, it, it was known as the bath chair town, um, uh, God's waiting room and all the rest of it. But the demographic has changed. A lot of younger people have come to Eastbourne, I think in the main because of affordable housing. Um, where they work, I don't know because years ago, um, the Industrial Association was proud to uh, extol the virtues of some 20 or 30 industrialists that used to make things in Eastbourne, like Nobo, used to make notice boards. And a lot of people don't realise that that's how the Nobo notice boards uh, came about. Um, uh, we used to make uh, screws for um, um, 13 amp plugs um, all sorts of amazing things, soap and um, a lot of uh, cosmetics were made in Eastbourne um, and one of the big factories um, is about to be uh, turned into uh, an Aldi at, at Tannen Park. Another big change in Eastbourne of course are pubs. Uh, there used to be something like 27 pubs I think and there are probably only about seven or eight now. That's, that's quite, quite a dramatic change. Um, but uh, the saddest change, of course, are the number of small businesses that have gone. Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with out-of-town shopping. You can now go out-of-town shopping and you can buy a can of paint at 3 o'clock in the morning, 24-hour shopping. And uh, the, little, the small DIY shops that used to be in Eastbourne, I think there are about you know, half a dozen of them, all gone, um, which, is, which is really sad. And it's a shame, really, because um, when you think about it, every large business started off as a small business. And uh, there are no small businesses now, unless they're in IT or something like that, or unless they can work hard and make it like I do. <laughs> as far as Eastbourne goes, now I, I plan to stay in Eastbourne. I, I do love the town. It's very convenient uh, for, say, Gatwick, if you're nip off on holiday. Um, it's just up the road, uh, and of course the uh, the coast of France is, is is brilliant because you've got Dover one end, or that's a bit of a trek, and you've got Newhaven. And Newhaven are talking about having another 
another ship which will make life easier. I think that's that's coming up in the summer. Um, Eastbourne's got a lot to offer. Uh, there's no no doubt about it. When I go to London, it's always nice to come back. I think being by the seaside, uh, there's something psychological about it, uh, having that vast amount of 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 of, uh, of, of sea close to close to the town. Thank you.